Here's an episode of How to Analyse Poetry from the Learning Cauldron. Today we'll be looking at Norman McCaig's poem, Aunt Julia. Analyzing poetry involves identifying and dissecting the literary techniques that the poet uses effectively to explore the theme or themes of a poem. In his poem Aunt Julia, Norman McCaig explores the themes of loss, not only of a person but also of Scottish culture, isolation and relationships. The title of the poem immediately introduces us to the subject, Aunt Julia. And immediately we're told in the first stanza a bit about Aunt Julia. Aunt Julia spoke Gaelic very loud and very fast. So immediately we get the impression of a dynamic lady and a lady who comes from a Highland setting, a Northwest Highland setting, because of the reference to the word choice of Gaelic. And the words loud and fast also give us a feel of her energy. And immediately we feel that this is a lady that we could enjoy meeting. And then he adds, I could not answer her and pauses as he reflects. I could not understand her. There's almost a faint humour here as he recollects the fact that he couldn't have answered her even if he wanted to because he didn't know what she was saying. So the use of the repetition there is very effective. And this is also repeated, in fact, the first two lines later on, as you can see at the end of the poem, the first two lines of the last stanza are exactly the same. Moving on to the second stanza, we learn more about this interesting lady. We're told that she wore men's boots And that immediately suggests that she has a tough life. She has to do the outside chores. It doesn't sound as if there's anyone else in her life. And she's a crofter. Crofting is the traditional way of farming where you have a small house and a small amount of land and you make your own living there by growing your own food and having your own sheep and cattle. So she would probably have had to go outside and do all these outside chores and that's why she required boots. But sometimes, he tells us, she didn't wear any. And he pauses here to reflect on this lady who has obviously meant a lot to him. And the nostalgic feel there is emphasised by this pause as he thinks about her. And he mentions that her feet were strong, again referencing the fact that she had to be tough for this lifestyle. And that they were stained with peat. And peat helps establish the setting here because peat is cut and dried and burned on fires. It's the soil underneath the grassland up on the hills and it would be cut every summer. And then there's the contrast, the indoor jobs. She would be spinning the wool from her sheep. And there's this lovely depiction of almost magic in the eyes of the young poet because these first verses are through his eyes as a child and he describes how her right hand drew yarn. Listen to these lovely long vowels as she pulls the wool out and then the enjoyment emphasising how marvellous it was in his eyes, marvellously. He admires his aunt. He's fascinated by this magic she can create by taking wool and turning it into yarn. And then moving on, the nostalgic tone increases again. It tells us that hers was the only house was, interesting use, it's the past tense still here, hers was the only house. And that tells us that he felt comfortable here because he says it's the only house where he's laying at night in the absolute darkness. Now, normally a child might be afraid of the darkness, but not here. Even though he can't understand this lady, his aunt, he feels safe with her. And that tells us something about Aunt Julia, that he didn't need language to communicate. He could tell she was a good person. There's a spiritual connection here. And then he talks about listening to the crickets being friendly and this lovely personification of the crickets showing again that he felt completely at ease in this natural setting, so different from his life in Edinburgh where he was brought up. Here he is in the Outer Hebrides, far away from home, but he feels completely comfortable. And the absolute darkness here is a stark contrast to the last stanza where we have absolute black, so bear that in mind. Moving on to the next stanza here, he describes her in terms of the elements, water and wind. She was, he says, buckets and water flouncing into them. And the word choice of flouncing in this metaphor shows us the movement, the way that she moved was confident and jaunty. And then he says she was winds pouring wetly. Lovely alliteration there, which I didn't pick up with the two W's, round house ends. So you imagine walking along the length of a house and you're in the shelter, you come to the end and suddenly you get slapped in the face almost by the wind. It's so powerful and so dynamic. And this was what she was like. And then he uses synecdoche by saying that she was brown eggs, black skirts and a keeper of threepenny bits in a teapot. Notice the lovely extended E sound here, the assonance, the repeated vowels. And by saying that she is each of these things, he is using those things to represent her. And the tone here is still nostalgic. 
Then, as mentioned previously, we have the repeated first two lines of the first stanza, but the change comes straight after. He says, by the time I had learned a little, she lay silenced in the absolute black. Listen to all these lovely, solemn L's, which gives it almost a funereal feel. And that is appropriate because we realise from the word choice of silenced, in contrast with loud and fast from before, that Aunt Julia has sadly passed away. And the absolute black contrasts with darkness, where he's comfortable. Black here symbolises death, because she is no longer with him. And the sadness is that he had learned some of her language, but it was too late for them to communicate. And then there's a slight change in tone. It becomes slightly more positive, but I hear her still. A change to the present tense here welcoming me with a seagull's voice. So a lovely use of metaphor, if we imagine the loud, screchy voice of a seagull, and it brings us in mind of that very loud and very fast voice that was referred to in the opening stanza. And he makes a reference here to two of the aspects of the crofting landscape, peat scrapes and lazy beds. Peat scrapes were the parts of the hill where, as I mentioned previously, they scraped away the grass to get at the peat underneath so they had fuel for their fire in the winter. And lazy beds were another type of bed that they cut into the ground. And this was where they would lay potatoes down and then cover them with seaweed, for example, rather than earth. And that was why it was lazy. They didn't dig the normal drills that potato farmers would dig. And there they would grow vegetables in these lazy beds. So very much harking to, harking back to the crofting land, lifestyle that Aunt Julia led. And then we have the repetition of getting angry, getting angry. And it's almost as if both he and she, the seagull's voice, is becoming angry, but he is also angry. And this tone of frustration, which we had at the beginning here, I could not, I could not, returns again through the use of repetition because he realises that there will now be so many questions and then this lovely enjoyment, leaving the word unanswered, loud and clear at the end of the poem. And that basically sums up the whole poem, this lack of communication during her lifetime and his regret now that they will know at no point be able to answer these questions that they wanted to ask each other. I hope that's been helpful. See you next time.